Order, workers, Senator Green. You will be in continuation when debate resumes. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, <coughs> Mr. President. Mr. President, I seek leave to make a statement regarding ministerial absences. Leave is granted. Uh, I thank the Senate. I advise the Senate that Senator Birmingham will be absent from question time today, Thursday, 13 February 2020, due to ministerial business overseas. Uh, in Senator Birmingham's absence, I will represent the Minister for the Environment and the Minister for Energy and Emissions Order. Reduction. Senator Payne will represent the Minister for Trade, Order. Tourism and Investment, and the Minister assisting the Minister for Trade and Investment, Senator Rustin, uh, will represent the Minister for Resources, uh, Water and Northern Australia. Senator Cash will represent the Minister for Education and the Minister for Decentralisation and Regional Education. I further advise uh, the Senate that Senator Reynolds will be absent from question time today due to ministerial business overseas. In Senator Reynolds' absence, I will represent the Order. Minister for Defence, the Minister for Veterans Affairs, the Minister for Defence Personnel, the Assistant Defence Minister and the Minister for Defence Industry, whereas Senator Rustin will represent the Minister for Communications, Cyber Safety and the Arts. Thank you. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. Yeah, yeah. Can the minister confirm that over the past two years, almost 30,000 Australians died while waiting for their approved home care package? How is this acceptable? The Minister for Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank, thank you, Mr President. Um, we, we have canvassed this issue a number of times in the chamber before, uh, and uh, no, no one, government or in opposition, I'm sure, Senator Keneally either, uh, wants to, uh, to see people passing away while they're waiting for a home care package. And Mr President, that is why, that is why uh, we've invested so heavily in home care packages since coming to government. Mr President, well, Sen Senator Keneally clearly hasn't been listening when uh, we've been uh, providing this information in the chamber before. When we came to government, Mr President, when we came to government, Mr. President, there were 60,000 home care packages in the market. As of today, as of today, there are 146,000 plus home care packages in the market, and that will be 150,000 home care packages by the end of this financial year. A significant increase, in fact, an investment of over 2.7 billion dollars, Mr. President, 2.7 billion dollars since the budget before last. We have made a significant investment. We put 10,000 additional places into the market on the back of the interim report of the Royal Commission, Mr President, because the Royal Commission drew our attention to that issue. We want to see the waiting time for Australians waiting for home care packages be reduced. Uh, that's why we've continued to invest in, in new home care packages and in fact invest into the aged care sector. We will continue to do that. Mr. President, there's a couple of numbers Senator Keneally should remember. A couple of numbers Senator Keneally should remember. Order. 387 billion and zero. 387 billion dollars of taxes that the Labor Party promised at the last election, and zero. Order. Care Senator packages. Colbeck, please resume your seat. Please resume your seat. Order. I'll take Senator Keneally's point. Order on my right. Senator Keneally on a point of order. Uh, direct relevance, Mr President. The question was fairly narrowly construed and made no mention of tax policy, either the government's nor that of the Labor opposition. It was specifically about whether or not it was acceptable that 30,000 people had died waiting for a home care package and, and, on their watch. And, and, until that straying in the last few seconds, I considered the minister directly relevant. Um, I'll, the attention has been drawn to the question. He has three seconds remaining. Three hundred and eighty seven billion Senator, dollars Senator in taxes Colbert, and zero Senator, home care packages, Senator, Mr. President. If I could address this myself, I'm happy to address this. I'm going to ask ministers that if I do say someone is not being directly relevant, to not get up and say the same thing again. That material was not directly relevant, and I actually said so. In the other place, the chair unilaterally sits down ministers. I have not taken that option, but if that happens, I will. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. I am willing to accord the senator, the minister, three extra seconds if he'd like S to sets, correct. Uh, uh, the time's expired. I'll, I'll set the clock again so you can um, commence your supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Why are up to all? Why are up to half of all older Australians in residential aged care malnourished? 
Senator Colbeck. Did you know that? Mr President, uh, I haven't uh, had that particular statistic put forward to me specifically. And, and, and I, and I, I, Mr President, and, and I don't believe, Mr President, I don't believe if that is the case. I don't believe that, that is the, if that's the case, if that's the case, if that's the case, it is acceptable. That would not be acceptable to me. It would not be acceptable to government. Order. And quite frankly, Order on my quite left. frankly, that would mean, Mr. President, that would mean that 50% of the aged care providers in this country are not meeting the standards that are established under the Quality and Safety Commission. That would mean that 50% of uh, residents receiving care would. Uh, would be the, the providers that providing that care would be in breach of their quality and safety commission uh, and their quality standards obligations because providing high quality care and food Order, is Colbert. clearly de time is clearly the answer down has expired. The Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Why is the Morrison government's priority to privatise aged care assessment services a demonstrably successful service that older Australians and their families rely upon and trust? Instead of ensuring that older Australians are receiving the quality aged care services they deserve now, Senator Colbeck. The government has never said that it was going to privatise aged care assessment services. It has never said that. It has been stated by others in the media that that's what was going to happen, but the government has never stated that. In fact, on a number of occasions, Mr. President, I have refuted that. I have refuted that. The Tune Review, if Senator Keneally bothered to do some research into the history of this sector, recommended the Tune Review. I'll Order take your, on my I left. will take your, Order I will on take my your rejection, Senator Polly. The Tune Review recommended combining ACATs and RASs in its 2017 report. The Tune Review recommended that we do that. The Royal Commission, Order, Senator in its Polly. interim report, Mr. President, said it was an urgent reform. That is why we are continuing with that reform, because the Tune Review recommended it in 2017, and the Aged Care Royal Order, Commission Senator said it Colbert, was urgent. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Henderson. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, yeah. Senator Cormann. Can the minister representing the Prime Minister inform the Senate how the Morrison government is building a stronger economy which rewards hard-working Australians? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr President. I uh, thank Senator Henderson uh, for that question. And Mr President, let me say up front, uh, it's really good to be here. Yeah. It's really good to be here. And uh, it's really good to be here to explain to the Senate what the Morrison government is doing to build a stronger economy, creating better opportunities for the Australian people to get ahead. Order. Because, of course, when we came into government, we inherited from the Labor Party a weakening economy, rising unemployment, a rapidly deteriorating budget position. We worked hard to turn that around. Last financial year, the budget returned to balance. This year, we are on track uh, to return the budget to surplus. And, of course, Order we have the first left. car and account surplus in Order. 40 years. We have, the, we have the lowest welfare dependency in more than 30 years. We have been able the biggest tax cuts in more than 20 years, leaving more money in people's pockets. And indeed, uh, Mr. President, more than 1.5 million new jobs created uh, under our period in government. In fact, in December, our employment rate fell to 5.1 per cent. When Labor lost government, it was on the way past 6 per cent. And indeed, uh, Mr. President, uh, retail trade volumes in the December quarter grew by 0.5 per cent, the strongest increase in a year and a half. Household disposable income in the September quarter had its biggest rise in a decade under our government, Mr. President, under our government, Mr. President. And indeed, building approvals are up by almost 3 per cent uh, year on year. This week, the Westpac uh, Melbourne Institute survey on consumer the survey was up by 2.3 per cent. We are delivering for the Australian people. While the Labor Party treats this institution with disrespect, we continue to do the job for the Australian people, building a stronger economy, creating more jobs, creating more opportunities for Australians to get ahead. That is why the Australian people re-elected us at the last election. That is why they voted against your socialist agenda, which they knew would leave every Australian worse off. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister representing the Prime Minister outline how the Morrison government's energy policies are supporting a strong economy? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, our, our policies are Order. all about delivering more affordable, Order on my more left. reliable energy supplies uh, in a way that helps us meet our emissions reduction targets. And of course, on this side of the chamber, Order on we my understand left. that it's very important to have a, uh, to have a responsible uh, and environmentally sustainable energy mix, uh, including, including, of course, uh, a very strong commitment to renewables. We are leading the world when it comes to the uh, investment uh, in Watt. renewables. But we also understand the need, uh, of course, uh, to, uh, to uh, ensure that we have got uh, affordable and reliable supplies based on coal and gas. Based on coal and gas. I mean, coal is and remains important to our energy security and our energy affordability. Not only does it provide cheap power, it also provides tens of thousands of jobs across regional communities. And of course, exporting Australian coal helps us to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions, which is why Labor should be supported. Order, Senator Cormann. Senator Henderson, a final supplementary question. Is the minister representing the Prime Minister aware of any similar? energy policies. Senator Cormann. Mr President, yes I am. Senator Farrell and the Otis Group. Senator Farrell and the Order. Otis Group. Order. Order. I've got Senator Wong on order. Senator Wong on a point of order. It was a very big wind-up, but actually, I yesterday probably should have taken a point of order on a similar question, I think, from Senator Renick, uh, which is there must be some reference to government policies. That wording was slightly better than yesterday's, but I would ask you. Oh, let me hear the point of order. I'll... Well, you are very excited very today, excited. aren't you? You're very excited. <laughs> very excited. Order. I'll so Senator I'll... Wong. I would ask you, Mr. President, that there is a lot of precedent associated with this type of question. It generally is a form of wording which the government is not complying with. I ask you to consider that. Uh, well, Senator Canavan on the point of order. Order, Mr. President. Um, uh, the, the, the reference here in this question or the relevance of the Otis Group is about government policy because it's a group of order. Labor MPs who want to adopt the government order, policy. Order, Senator Canavan. Um, the, uh, uh, Order. After yesterday, I, I, I did consult the clerk on this matter um, with my ability to potentially foresee a question. Um, the previous ruling that's been applied by numerous presidents, Cybra, Reid and Calvert, is that a question which invites a minister to comment on the policies or actions of non-government parties is out of order unless the question seeks an expression of the government's intentions in some matter of ministerial responsibility. Now, in my view, yesterday's question probably crossed that line. Um, I, I will review, let the minister continue this, but I will review the Hansard on the basis that this question, which I don't have detailed notes of, asked for the minister's awareness. Um, and so I, I will not rule it out of order at this point, but I will, I will review the Hansard. And can I urge my colleagues who do uh, ask questions to keep that, those standing orders in mind? Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I am optimistic about our future because we now know that Senator Farrell is leading the next generation of Labor leaders uh, into supporting more responsible economic policies, and that is a great thing. And courtesy of Channel 10, we now know who the members of this coal industry, coal workers supporting Otis Group are. And uh, indeed, you know, we've got, I mean, Senator Stirl is on there twice. Senator Stirl is on there twice. Order, and sorry, I would, order, Senator Cormann. Senator Wong, were you raising a point of order? I was consulting the clerk, so I. It's going to hold up a prop. Oh, well, if props, prop, props are not appropriate, my apologies. I was consulting the clerk. I'll call Senator Cormann to continue. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Quite a few Labor senators on there. Senator, Turl, uh, Senator Stirl appears there twice. But is he is he particularly committed, or is he covering for somebody else? Maybe maybe he's covering for Senator Sheldon because I mean he wrote a big job application for the Audit Group nine years ago. In fact, it was written up by one Matthew Franklin. One Matthew Franklin. You might know who that is. I think he might work in Mr. Albanese's office uh, because Senator Sheldon appeared in front of my uh, inquiry when he described Labor Green carbon taxes as death taxes. Order, and Senator so Coleman. I, I the, uh, order, Senator Cormann. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Muriel Smith. Order. My question, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Defence, Industry, Senator Cormann. 
The former Minister for Defence confirmed that 90 per cent of the work on the submarine project will be Australian. Today, the Australian reports, and I quote, local firms may not get half of the value of the sub's contracts. Can the minister confirm what the actual level of Australian content will be? The minister representing the Minister for Defence well, Industry, much. Senator Cormann. What I, what I can assure Senator Smith about is that the uh, Australian industry content, building the next generation of uh, submarines, is going to be massively higher than it would have been under Labor. Yeah. Uh, massively higher than under Labor. Senator, Senator Wong on a point of order. I know he's very excited, Mr. President, but direct relevance. This is a serious question about the largest procurement in the nation's history. It is asking this minister representing the defence minister what the actual level of Australian content will be. Now, I know he's very excited and wants to play politics, but if he could answer the question oh, about order. people's jobs, order. we would really, I'm sure, South Australians order. and Senator Western Wong, Australians would appreciate it. It's not a, Senator Wong, you raised your point of order. I'm not go the minister was halfway through his a sentence. I'm not going to rule halfway through his first sentence on direct relevance. You've reminded the minister of the, of the question. I'll call him to continue. Thank you very much, Mr. President. It is our government that has committed to build the next generation of, uh, of submarines. It is our government that has made the necessary decisions and put on the table the necessary investment. And it is our government that is absolutely committed to maximising Australian industry involvement. Absolutely committed to that. But let me tell you, let me tell you the reason. The reason the reason why my opening remarks were entirely relevant, directly relevant to the question, uh, is because you know, what we are looking at now and the level of Australian industry content on the back of our decisions to build 12 new submarines for Australia is under LIBOR in six years. What was there? Nothing. Did they decide to build a single submarine, even half a submarine? No, nothing. Zero. Oh, like Otis. Like, I mean, th this is what we get from the LIBOR party. So the people in South Australia, the people in uh, Australia generally know that this is the government that is committed to not only ensure that our defence forces have got the capability they need, but that order. our— Order. Senator, Senator Wong, on a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance. Some of us—I think the Australian people do want to know what the level of Australian content is that has been asked by Senator Patrick, Senator Griff today. It's being asked by the Labor Party. We'd ask the minister to respond to the question. On the point of order, you've restated the question, Senator Wong. When the minister was talking about Australian content and the building of um, the project, I do consider that to be directly relevant because I cannot instruct him how to answer a question. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Under our government, we, are, we have committed to building 12 new submarines and we are committed to maximising Australian industry content. And the Australian people know that under Labor, not a single cent, not a single cent was invested uh, in our future submarine capability. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. When did the minister become aware that less than 50 per cent of the work for the future submarines would be done in Australia? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I don't accept the premise of the question, and I refer Senator Smith to my previous answer. Senator Smith, a final supplementary question. When did the Morrison government advise the South Australian Liberal government that the level of local content would be less than 50 per cent of the value of the contracts? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. As Senator Payne just uh, rightly uh, observed, just because you keep repeating the same false assertion doesn't make it come true. I reject the premise of the question, and uh, as I've said in my primary answer, we are absolutely committed to maximising Australian industry content. Senator Faruqi. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Your government has relentlessly attacked students striking for climate action. The Prime Minister said kids should go to school. The Deputy Prime Minister denounced anything that would disrupt schools. Even, on you, my right. even you, Minister Cormann, said during the school time kids should be in school. But because, but Order because on my your right. government's inaction on the climate crisis has made natural disasters more frequent and intense, the bushfires disrupted the education of tens of thousands of students this summer. On just one day in November, my home state of New South Wales saw more than 600 schools shut down. Will you acknowledge that your criminal inaction on climate emergency is the real disruption to students? 
The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President, uh, and I thank Senator Faruqi uh, for that question. Uh, let me confirm for Senator Faruqi uh, that uh, the government and every single Liberal National uh, Senator uh, is firmly of the view that children should attend school during school time. Yeah. Firmly of that view. That has been our view. It remains our view. It will be our view in the future. Let me also say that our government is absolutely committed to effective action on climate change. What we are not proposing to do is to harm Australian families, to harm young people in Australia and their future prospects by forcing them to uh, accept sacrifices which will make the global environment worse off. I mean, shifting their jobs and economic activity from Australia into other parts of the world by imposing burdens that will actually uh, lead to higher pollutions, uh, pollution levels in other parts of the world is not in the best interest of the Australian people and is not in the best interest of school children around Australia who rely on us, who rely on us to have opportunities in the future. So we will continue to do the right thing by pursuing a policy agenda that is environmentally effective and economically responsible. We know that that is not your view. We know that you have a more extreme view where you want to, you're quite happy to harm the future opportunities of Australian families in order to make yourself feel better domestically, even though emissions globally will be higher as a result of your actions. That is not something that we will ever do. Senator Faruqi, a supplementary question. When the Prime Minister said the worst thing he could impose on any child is needless anxiety, he ignored students' fears about their future under a climate-denying government. Their fears were realised as the fires forced students from their classrooms and their homes. Will you now admit students' climate anxiety is real and won't go away until there is strong action on the climate emergency? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, I mean, let, let me just say, uh, I, I think that the Australian Greens have got a lot to answer for when it comes to unnecessary anxieties among young people. Unnecessary anxieties among young people. What we are committed to do is to do the right thing by the environment in a way that is economically responsible and in a way that is Order. responsible in consideration of the future opportunities that young people across Australia uh, are going to rely on. We will continue to take effective action on climate change. Our emissions reduction targets on a per capita basis is among the highest in the world. Half, by 50 per cent, uh, we are proposing to reduce emissions on a per capita basis. By two thirds, we are proposing uh, to reduce emissions on an emissions intensity unit per GDP, emissions per unit of GDP basis. It is one of the most ambitious targets all around the world. But of course, when the Greens are sitting there shaking their head, we we'll just have to agree to disagree. Uh, we will continue to go to the Australian people and say we are committed to effective action on climate change. We are committed to uh, an environmental policy agenda that is environmentally effective but Order, economically Senator responsible. Coleman, you time for the your answer way. has expired. Senator Faruqi, a final supplementary question. The Liberals and Nationals have spent more time criticising brave children working for a better future than they have fixing their disastrous pro-coal climate policies that have us hurtling towards three degrees of warming. Will you now apologise to the climate strike students who are doing more than your government to fight the climate crisis? Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, I, I don't quite know how not attending school helps to reduce emissions, I've got to tell you. I don't really know. And let me, let me also tell you something else. Like Senator Sheldon, uh, I was very much of the view that the Labour Green uh, carbon tax uh, was actually making things worse and was not something uh, that, should, that should be supported. And now, of course, we know that there, is, that there is an opportunity for a bipartisan energy policy and a bipartisan climate policy in the future because we are looking forward to working with the Otis Group uh, in the Labour Party uh, to ensure that there is sensible economic policy for Australia where, where we have environmentally effective and economically responsible policies moving forward. It is great to see that those people in the Labour Party that wanted to harm Australian families through their Labour Green carbon tax are losing influence and that Senator Farrell is taking charge. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Minister Colbeck. This week, the ABC Investigations Unit highlighted the fact that aged care facilities can employ as few staff as they like, and that a study of 800 nursing homes showed the average food spend for residents was a paltry $6 a day. The ABC story also referenced an amendment I put forward in December, which would have required aged care providers to reveal what proportion of their funds they actually spent on delivering care, and how much goes to other things like lining the pockets of their parent bodies. The government, joined by Senator Hanson and Senator Roberts, voted against this simple but necessary reform. 
Why does the government not believe that the sector needs to be more transparent in how it spends taxpayer dollars? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator Griff, for the question. Uh, it is an important question to discuss. And, uh, this government has worked uh, extremely hard over recent years, including, Royal, including calling the Royal Commission, uh, to, to conduct an extensive review of the industry and how we might redesign it moving forward. So the issues that Senator Griff, so the, so the issues that Senator Griff talks about, um, will be quite rightly considered as part of that Royal Commission process, and I'm certain that. Uh, uh, Senator Alliance and those associated will make represent, re representations to the Royal Commission appropriately to put those issues forward. The legislation that we passed last year uh, came out of recommendations of the carnell patterson review into the terrible circumstances that occurred in South Australia uh, at a government-owned nursing home there. Um, and that was to bring together into one organisation the regulatory f works of the um, Quality and Safety Commissioner all under one roof, rather than having them split between the Quality and Safety Commission, which we created as part of the recommendation process of the Colonel Patterson Review at the beginning of last year, and we've brought all of that under the umbrella of one organisation, which was part of those recommendations. It was important, Mr President, that uh, those, that legislation passed before Christmas, because the new body was due to be formed on the 1st of January this year, which it was which it was. The government believes, even though those issues that Senator Griffiths uh, talks about are important and uh, there are uh, measures being put in place with respect to transparency, the measures in the amendments brought forward by Senator Griff were best considered in the context of the Royal Commission rather than just through an amendment in the chamber. Uh, and so the government is quite Order, happy Senator to consider Colbeck, those things in that answer context. Order, Senator has expired. Senator Griff, a supplementary question. Mr. In its interim report, the Royal Commission noted that there is no public information on the way providers use taxpayer funds and individual contributions to uh, deliver aged care services. Government hasn't waited for the final Royal Commission report before considering privatising ACAT and the Regional Assessment Service. What's the difference here, Minister? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, well, a significant difference. Uh, and it's not completely true that there are no financial records available uh, for the expenditure in aged care facilities because the public listed one, publicly listed companies um, are all publicly listed uh, are reported publicly. So if you're interested in some of that detail, go and have a look there. It's true for many that, that it's not, uh, and that may, may very well that may very well form part of the recommendations of the Royal Commission, which will be brought down on the 9th of November this year. But the difference, the difference in what you're talking about and the reforms that we're undertaking uh, goes to the answer that I gave Senator Keneally earlier. And that is that the combination of ACAT, and I refute the terminology being utilised by those on the other side uh, with respect to privatisation, because I don't believe that that's the case. Uh, and that is not what we've said publicly. It's what the media have said and what others have said, is that the uh, the, this follows on recommendations of the Carnell Patterson Review and, in fact, the Royal Commission. Senator Griff, a final supplementary question. A, a few days, Minister, responding to my motion calling on the government to legislate for financial transparency, Senator Dunham, and in fact you virtually repeated it there, stated that the government recognises the need for financial transparency and access of senior Australians and their families to information to help them make informed decisions, and we have included some measures in this regard. What measures in this regard was Senator Dunham and yourself referring to? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, some of the, some of the transparency measures that we've already put in place would be re particularly in respect of clinical care, and there are three clinical care indicators that were required to be reported by the sector starting from the 1st of July last year. There are two more that are being considered now, Mr President, uh, and we will continue consulting with the sector. And in fact, I wrote. Uh, to the uh, advisory committee to the Quality and Safety Commission late last year, asking them to report back to me about what other regulatory tools the Quality and Safety Commission might need. Um, that, I've received that report, Mr President, and I've in fact referred that report to the Royal Commission so that they can quite properly consider those things in the context of their report that will come back to this year. Senator Macdonald. 
My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister inform the Senate as to why it is important to maintain a consistent policy approach to the Australian resources sector? The Minister representing the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And can I thank um, Senator Macdonald for her question? Because, uh, like me, she understands the huge importance of the resources sector to her home state of Queensland as well as my home state of South Australia. Um, and we are absolutely committed in this, uh, on this side of the chamber to the stable management of the resources sector, which is booming. Uh, it's generating record profits, uh, record exports, record royalties, and it's paying record taxes. Um, but most importantly, most importantly, it is generating jobs, jobs in rural and regional Australia. Uh, resource sector uh, accounts for about 8 per cent of Australia's GDP and 59 per cent of our export earnings, um, $279 billion in 2018-19, iron ore $77 billion, LNG exports $50 billion. But guess what? 245,000 Australians are employed in the resource sector. That's 2 per cent of our workforce. Absolutely extraordinary. And it's one of the fastest growing uh, employers in Australia. 94,000 more people work in the mining and uh, resource sector today than they did in 2005. And many of these jobs are highly skilled. They're highly skilled jobs and they're also in rural and regional Australia. And it is our resources sector that enables us to be able to sustain this level of workforce uh, outside of our capital cities. Um, and to ensure this is continued and to maintain our resource sector and to maintain something that is the backbone of our regional communities, the Australian government is absolutely committed to further investment in ensuring that our resource sector continues to go from strength to strength. Whether it be removing red tape or supporting our workforce, we are behind our resources sector. Senator Macdonald, a supplementary question. Can the minister advise as to the importance of the coal mining sector, in particular, to the Australian economy? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. And a very important part of our resources sector is our coal mining sector. Um, Australia is the largest exporter of metallurgical coal and the second largest exporter of thermal coal, $70 billion to the Australian economy, and $6 billion paid in royalties. And that $6 billion pays for schools, pays for hospitals, pays for roads. But I thought I'd like to take the opportunity to just fact-check the Greens uh, today, because this morning the ABC confirmed that there are in fact more people working in the coal industry than as baristas. The fact is that 16,700 full-time baristas in Australia, whereas the coal industry actually employs in excess of 50,000 uh, people. And those 50,000 people actually happen to be in the home state of Senator Macdonald, who asked the question, but also Senator Waters, uh, who is also a Queensland senator. And let's not forget the Order. two billion— Order. Senator Rustin. Time <coughs> for the answers expired. Senator Macdonald, a final supplementary question. Is the minister aware of any similar policy approaches to maintaining a strong coal mining sector, supporting a stronger economy? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Macdonald. Well, I'm not quite sure. Um, however, one thing that I can be uh, sure of is that I am confused about what the policy on the other side is in relation to jobs in the mining sector. Um, Probably quite, uh, quite unusual for Senator Farrell and I to be on a unity ticket when it comes to rural and regional jobs, uh, but we certainly have been uh, on a unity ticket when it comes to the wine industry, and once again we are on a unity ticket when it comes to supporting rural and regional jobs, rural and regional jobs in our resources sector. Um, perhaps those opposite that are having a fun time interjecting might actually uh, take consideration of the impact of the Carmichael coal mine. Um, Two billion dollars, and guess how many jobs have already been created at the Carmichael coal mine? Over 800 in Queensland, in the hope. But uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps we might remember that uh, Senator uh, Senator Farrell is supporting rural and regional jobs. Order. Perhaps you should Senator too. Rustin. Senator O'Neill.
Senator O'Neill. On my left, I'm calling one of your colleagues, Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. In response to the Morrison government's plans to put aged care assessment services out to tender, New South Wales Health Minister Brad Hazard has revealed that New South Wales has major concerns and that the plan lacks logic. Is Mr Hazard correct? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Well, Mr President, I disagree with Mr Hazard quite clearly. Uh, and I disagree with Mr Hazard because uh, I'm, I'm actually implementing a recommendation from uh, the Tune Review, uh, and I'm actually doing what the Royal Commission said in its interim report last year, which is this reform is urgent. He said that, so, Mr President, I understand Mr Hazard has a perspective on this, and I have spoken to Mr Hazard with respect to, to these reforms. We had a conversation earlier in the year, and, and we have a different point of view, Mr President. We have a different point of view. Mr Hazard, Mr. Hazard believes that New South Wales government should do all aged care assessments. I don't, I don't agree with him. I actually don't agree with him. The Tune Review, Mr. President, doesn't agree with him. And the Royal Commission says, get on with it. The Royal Commission says the reform recommended in the Tune Review is urgent. So, Mr. President, I do have a difference of opinion with, with uh, Mr. Hazard, the New South Wales Minister. Uh, we will continue our dialogue with New South Wales. Mr. Hazard has been very, very open with me. He sent me a number of documents that have given me the opportunity to work through the New South Wales perspective. And we will continue to have that dialogue, Mr. President, because the one thing that I'm really determined to, to see, and I know Mr. Hazard is also determined to see, is that when people go through an assessment process, they get an assessment that is appropriate. It provides appropriately for their needs. It refers them to the services that are appropriate for their needs, and they then get access to those services, Mr. President. So, Order. In, in the context of our core uh, desires, Mr. President, Mr. Hazard and I are on exactly the same plane. We have a different perspective on how that might be achieved, Mr. President. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. In response to his Liberal colleagues' criticism, Mr Colbeck claimed that the government's plan to put aged care assessment services out to tender was supported by the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety. Does the minister stand by this claim? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, uh, I've just, in my previous answer, uh, indicated a couple of things with respect to the process that we're currently going through right now. Firstly, firstly, Mr. President. Order, Senator O'Neill, on a point of order. So I I'm listening very carefully. The minister has just wound up to indicate he's going to talk about a process. I've got no process question embedded in what I asked. It was simply, does the minister with stand by his claim with regard to a statement uh, okay. of the royal aged commissioner? I, I, the minister was clearly preparing to answer. I cannot. We cannot take points of order on what a minister may be may be saying. I have to listen carefully to what he is saying. Um, I will listen carefully, but with respect, he has been speaking for about 14 seconds. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. This, this is a, an important reform that was, that was recommended by uh, the Tune Review, uh, and the Royal Commission said in its— Oh, Sen Senator O'Neill. On a point of order. Sorry, I was watching and listening to Senator Colbeck. I missed you standing. My question goes nowhere near the Tune Review. My question goes to the Minister's claim that the government's plan to put out uh, aged care services to tender was supported by the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety. That is it. That's all well, there is. There's nothing else to you, work you, with, you, Senator you, Colbeck. You, you reminded the Minister of his question. I, I, I heard him talking about the government's plans. I can't instruct him how to answer a question. I've given you the opportunity to remind him of it again. I will listen carefully to his remaining 28 seconds. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. In context and in timeline, this reform was recommended by Tune in 2017, and the Royal Commission, in its report last year, said the reform was urgent. 
And yes, I do believe that supports my view that this reform should go ahead. Senator O'Neill, final supplementary question. Oh, it should have been a point of order on that non-answer. But anyway, um, sorry. The chair of the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety, Commissioner Pagoni, has had to publicly refute the minister's claim, stating that the commission's interim report, and I quote, and this is this is what he said, did not endorse the government's stated position. Will the minister correct the record? Has the minister apologised to the commission for falsely stating its position? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Th thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my statements always have been in the context of the tuna review recommendations and the fact that the Royal Commission said that this was an urgent reform. Uh, I can actually very much understand the Royal Commission. I can very much understand the Royal Commission's statement, given the reporting of my comments versus what I actually said, Mr. President, that I was intending to privatise the ACAT services. I have never ever said that, Mr. President. And so I can actually understand the Royal Commission. Uh, responding to a reporting of my comments that wasn't correct, Mr. President. Order. Uh, and I issued a statement immediately. I saw the comments of the Royal Commission, acknowledging the primacy of the Royal Commission. I, I acknowledged the Royal Commission, the work that it was doing, and the government's willingness to engage closely with Order, the Royal Commission Senator on these Colbeck. reforms. Time for the answer has expired, Senator Molan. Thank you, Mr. President. And my question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the Minister inform the Senate how the Morrison government's consistent policies are delivering more Australian jobs and getting more Australians off welfare and into work? The Minister for Employment, Skills for Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. And I thank Senator Molan for the question because, Senator, uh, Mr. President, since we were elected to government, this side of politics has ensured that the economy has created in excess now of 1.5 million jobs. Mr. President, as of December 2019, we now have a record number of Australians in employment. Almost 13 million Australians are in employment because the Morrison government, the coalition government, has put in place the policies that are ensuring their employers out there are able to prosper, grow and create more jobs for Australians. Additionally, Mr President, we have now record high male employment in Australia, 6,814,300 men. We have record high female employment, and uh, I acknowledge the Minister for Women and the great work that she is doing to increase women's workforce participation, and in particular in light of International Women's Day coming up. We also have record high youth employment in Australia. Almost two million young people in Australia are in employment because of the policies that this side of politics, the Liberal national side of politics, have put in place. Mr President, over the calendar year to December 2019, employment increased by over 260,000 jobs. That is above the decade average growth. But also, Mr. President, in terms of those jobs, almost 60 per cent of them were full-time jobs. That's right, the policies that we're putting in place on the Liberal national side of the uh, government are able to ensure that all types of jobs are created, but in particular, full-time jobs growth is high under this government. Senator Molan, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. And the supplementary question is: Can the minister inform the Senate how the Morrison government is supporting Australians who work in the resources sector? Senator Cash. Well, I can, Mr. President. And as a senator for Western Australia, and also the senators for Queensland, uh, in particular, uh, we understand the benefits of the resources sector to Australians, and in particular uh, in rural and regional Australia. At the last election, in fact, you just have to look at the result in the state of Queensland. Because what did Queenslanders do? They emphatically endorsed the Morrison government's commitment to mining jobs. What was that, Senator Coleman? How many? 77 per cent of the seats. What did they also do in Queensland? They rejected the Labor opposition's pandering to inner-city elites 
and the Australian Greens. And why did they do that? Because they understand that the resources sector in Australia creates jobs for Australians. Mr President, the coalition government, the Morrison government, we support mining because the resources sector accounts not just for employment but so much when it comes to the contribution to our GDP. Order, Senator Cash. Senator Mole on a final supplementary question. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Mr President. And my supplementary question is, are there others who support the government's policies supporting the workers in the resources sector? Senator Cash. Well, there are, Mr President, and it will be a little surprise to the Senate to know that they are ably led by the Order. Godfather himself, one of the wines, I understand, Senator Farrell, Order. on the wine list. It's a Cabernet, $110 a bottle, colleagues, but we don't hold that against you. We don't hold that against you, Senator Farrell. Can I just say, though, colleagues, Senator, former Senator Doug Cameron, who cannot get over the fact that he was unceremoniously retired from this place. Senator Farrell, you have even gone up more in my esteem, as have the other members in the Senate of the Otis Group, because this is what your, I'd say good friend, but is clearly not, and former colleague has said about you. Given the names associated with this group, I'm not surprised not the sharpest tools in the shed. So that was Senator, former Senator Doug Cameron cannot help himself. But Senator Farrell, what we say to you, what we say to Senator Stirl, Senator Kitching, Senator Chisholm, Senator Polly, Senator Ciccone, welcome to order, the world Order, order, Senator Cash. Order on my right. Order. I'll give you the call when I can hear you, Senator Watt. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the Minister confirm that despite Australia experiencing the most devastating bushfires in living memory, the Morrison government has approved only one concessional loan for small businesses in bushfire affected areas across the entire country? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And, uh, as Senator Watt would know, uh, the coalition government has announced a comprehensive package, uh, in particular in relation to small businesses. What I can confirm for the Senate is the following. As you would be aware, Mr President, the states, the state Labor government, the state Victorian government, which is a Labor government, the New South Wales government and the South Australian government are actually responsible for the administration of both the grants and the loans. In relation to New South Wales, I am advised, in relation to the small business grants of up to $50,000 for businesses that are directly affected by the fires, there have been 252 order. Senator, what on a point of order on, on relevance the minister is quoting figures about grants my questions were about loans and in fact i've only asked something that the prime minister confirmed yesterday she should be on well, top senator, of this I, I was listening carefully to the minister um, i was listening order i'll rule on the point of order when there's silence I was listening very carefully to the minister. I didn't catch the reference you referred to. I, immediately prior to that, the minister was talking about the grants program and its administration, which I do consider to be directly relevant. I'm listening carefully because it was a specific question. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. In relation to the grants, 252 applications have been received, 45, uh, 46 grants paid out worth over $690,000, and the average grant requested is just under $30,000. On a point of order. Direct relevance, Mr. President. We only asked about the confirmation of one concessional loan across the country for small business. So, uh, no, uh, uh, no, uh, uh, no, one concessional um, loan across the country. We asked the minister to confirm, uh, and as Senator Watt, I think, courteously indicated, it is the figure the Prime Minister confirmed yesterday. Um, the, on the point of direct relevance, um, the minister can be directly relevant to the question by, by talking about the concessional loan scheme and its administration, as she was earlier. But I do take the point the grant scheme was not in the question. Um, but I remind senators that I can't instruct the minister how to answer the question. Senator Cash. Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. President. And in relation to the loans, uh, senators will be aware that what the government has done is allow access to loans of up to half a million dollars. They are being administered through the states, and I can advise in relation to New South Wales, the loan scheme opened on the 3rd of February 2020. 42 applications have been received and are currently under review. The value of the loans requested is around $3,300,000. In relation to Queensland, the concessional loans opened on the 3rd Order. of February 2020. Senator, Senator Watt, on direct relevance? On direct relevance, the question is about the approval of loans, not applications well, received, no, Senator Watt, not what they're I, at, I made, approval I, I, of look, loans. I, I, I grant some latitude to people restating the question. I, my previous ruling was that the minister can be directly relevant by talking about the specific scheme that you referenced. You are seeking to order me how to direct the minister to answer a question, which is not appropriate for me to do. There is an opportunity after question time to debate the merits of answers. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. In relation to Queensland, concessional loans opened on 3 February 2020. Two applications have been received and one has been approved. The South Australian government has activated the scheme. They have currently got 60 expressions of interest and guidelines are currently being considered by Victoria and the ACT. Perhaps you could speak to those Labor governments, Senator Watt, and advise them that, yes, they can work with the Commonwealth government Order. because Senator they Cash, are the ones who actually need to the activate answer the has scheme. Expired. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. I refer to the Prime Minister's media release of the 20th of January that assured struggling small businesses in bushfire-affected regions that government support would be, and I quote, immediate. Does the minister seriously suggest that only one bushfire-affected small business was in immediate need of assistance? Senator Cash. Uh, well, only those on the opposite side of the chamber, uh, the Labor Party, would want to pay politics with what is occurring in relation to the bushfires. Uh, Mr President, the bushfires that we saw over the summer have been absolutely devastating, in particular for those who have been directly impacted by the fires, for those who have also been indirectly impacted by the fires. The government has announced a comprehensive package, a $2 billion response package, to assist those in need as a result of the devastation of the bushfires. And Mr President, you see, those on the other side don't seem to understand this. The only reason that this government has been able to respond so quickly with so many different measures and to the extent that we have been able to, $2 billion is because we manage a Order, strong Senator economy. Cash. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. I note the Minister's comments that Labor is playing politics. and I also note that this week New South Wales Liberal Minister Andrew Constance said that he wants to see better support for small business affected by bushfires and, I quote, we cannot afford another disaster on a disaster. Our fragile economy is already on its knees. Does the government believe one small business concessional loan is sufficient support? Senator Cash. Uh, I completely reject the premise of your question. And again, only someone like Senator Watt, who conveniently visited seats in Queensland that we picked up, um, would be able to play politics with what's going on with the bushfires. Mr President, I have personally spoken Order. to Andrew Constance. Can I assure you he is fully aware of the support that both the state government and the federal government are providing. In relation Order. to New South Wales, at least the New South Wales government have activated their scheme and are currently considering expressions of interest. Order. Senator, Senator Watt, Watt, perhaps you would like to speak to the Labor State Government of Victoria, the Labor State Government of the ACT, and advise them as well that they are actually the ones responsible for activating the loans under the scheme. But, Mr President, we have provided a comprehensive response to billion dollars. Order, Senator and this Cash. Is only time made for the answer has expired. Oh, sorry, Senator Wong. Uh, I thank the senator. I seek leave to table the hand side of the prime minister yesterday in the house, confirming only one concessional loan has been approved across the country. Is, is leave granted? There, there are usual courtesies that apply to tabling documents, and I think Senator Wong knows those courtesies. Okay, so leave is denied for the, at the moment. Senator Askew. 
Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Can the Minister update the Senate on what progress has been made in improving gender balance on, in, on Australian government boards? Thank you. The Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and thank you very much uh, to Senator Askew for that uh, question. A fine uh, female senator from Tasmania, Mr. President. I also actually want to thank my ministerial colleagues here and in the other place for their commitment to gender diversity when making Australian government board appointments. As of 30 June last year, and the figures have just been released, Australian women held 47.9 per cent of Australian government board positions, which is an all-time high. This is, a, this is the highest percentage of women on government boards since public reporting began more than a decade ago, and I think it's an achievement that we can all welcome, Mr President. It represents a 7.4 percentage point increase since the gender diversity target of 50 per cent was set in 2016. Positively again, women accounted for 54 per cent of new appointments to government yeah. boards, which is an increase of 4.7 percentage points in the six months to June, 30 June 2019. We know that gender diversity on boards and in other leadership positions contributes to more effective and innovative decision-making and outcomes. The government is strongly committed, and I am personally yeah. committed, yeah. to increasing gender diversity on Australian government boards and to reaching our 50 per cent target. Boards should reflect the full diversity of Australia, and we should use the rich resource of the talent of Australia's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, culturally and linguistically diverse women, LGBTI women, women with disability, women living all over the country. Our progress towards gender balance on government boards is improving leadership choices for Australian women every day. And as a government, we're committed to targeting key areas that promote greater choice for women, as we demonstrated in our Women's Economic Security Statement last year, including by increasing women's workforce participation, supporting economic yeah. independence and improving earning potential. Senator, ask you a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister advise what strategies the government has developed for reaching the 50 per cent target for women on boards? Senator Payne. Thank you very much. And again, I thank Senator Askew for her question, because it is important that there is a range of strategies, and the government has a number, to reach that 50 per cent target. It includes the fact that portfolio ministers are specifically asked to do a number of things, to identify female candidates, to encourage external bodies that, nominate, uh, that propose nominations to uh, consider gender diversity in that process, and to develop specific strategies with their departments and agencies. Our annual public reporting of gender balance on Australian government boards also plays a really important role in our tracking of progress against our target and in driving change. We maintain the board links database to assist portfolios to identify uh, suitably qualified, board-ready female candidates. A number of our departments and our agencies have adopted strategies tailored to their portfolios. Certainly my own has, and I know that the Department of Defence, for example, offers training to diversify their board membership to support the pipeline of board-ready women. These are all Order. positive Senator initiatives Payne, and Senator strategies. Senator ask you a sub final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. What other progress has the government made to improve gender balance in public roles, and how does this compare to other approaches that the minister is aware of? Senator Payne. Um, thank you, Mr President. The government is investing in a range of projects that foster women's leadership. They include Sport Australia's Women Leaders in Sport program, the Council of Small Business Organisation of Australia's Academy for Enterprising Girls, which I had the opportunity to meet last year. They're an absolutely fabulous group. And that's encouraging the next generation of women leaders in STEM and in business. I also want to acknowledge the work of organisations such as the Australian Institute of Company Directors, Commonwealth Bank, for example, who together are using the board level podcast to promote advice from Australia's leading female directors. And thanks also to groups like the Male Champions of Change for their leadership, with 62.4 per cent of members improving gender balance in management positions in their organisations. I want to applaud the efforts of so many Australian organisations that are improving gender balance in public roles and actively encourage those who still have more to do to take up the opportunity, to take up the challenge and to deliver. Order. Senator yeah. Payne. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. How many Australians were pursued under the government's illegal robo-debt scheme? 
The Minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and thanks Senator Brown for her question. Um, the Senator Wood may be aware that on the 19th of November, uh, the Minister for Government Services, the Honourable Stuart Robert, uh, made an announcement in relation to further uh, refinements in relation to the income compliance program. Um, those measures were uh, designed to, to strengthen and, uh, and to improve the program that was introduced by the Labor Party in 2011. Um, however, design, the program changes are designed to make it more robust by requiring more information to be provided in relation to people when we are seeking to determine whether a debt has actually been incurred. As you'd be aware from announcements last year, the government is no longer using uh, income averaging solely as a reason for raising a debt. Uh, however, as you would also be aware, this matter is before the courts, uh, and so any further comment in relation to this— Order. Senator <coughs> Brown. Uh, direct relevance. It, there was only one question, and I, the, I've waited for a while, and I would like the minister to actually answer the question I uh, asked. So um, you've reminded the minister of your question. I, I, I do. There was an assertion in the question about the legality of it. So the minister is in order to being directly relevant, addressing that. I think there was the word illegal. Um, the minister can be in order directing that as well. I've allowed you the minister to I've allowed you to remind the minister of the question, and I. Call the minister to continue. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. So, um, as the minister, as the member would, uh, the senator would also be aware that at the time that this cha chamber was uh, was advised, as well as the other chamber, uh, and it was also advised in the media uh, that, that that we would no longer be using um, uh, income averaging. Uh, with the ATI was the sole reason for uh, determining a debt for somebody who potentially had been overpaid by Centrelink. We also advised that there was a review being undertaken. That review is currently underway and forms part of, uh, of the process that is currently before the courts, uh, and I am not in a position to preempt the outcome of the court's deliberations. Senator Brown, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How much money are those illegally pursued owed? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. I'd refer the senator to my answer to the previous question, and that is that the review is on foot, and when I'm in a position to come back to this chamber with more information, I will do so. Senator Brown, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. When will those illegally pursued be paid back? Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And I would once again refer the Senator to my previous question, when I advised her that there is a review underway at the moment in relation to the matters of which she has raised. And once that review is completed, um, the, she will be able to get the answer to her question. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. I ask that further questions yeah. be placed on a notice paper. Thank you. Now, as I flag to leaders, I wish to make a brief statement now, uh, and the Speaker will be making a similar statement in the House of Representatives. I wish to address an article published by an ABC journalist based on a confidential working draft of an internal review conducted by KPMG into protective security Pro policy framework, the PSPF alignment, on behalf of the Department of Parliamentary Services. I wish to assure senators that this article does not reflect the true state of the department's protective security maturity. The department continues to work closely with the Australian Signals Directorate in managing Australia's cyber resilience. As senators have previously been advised, DPS worked in partnership with the Australian Cyber Security Centre and ASD in dealing with a cyber security incident in January 2019. I note that the ASD commented in its 1819 annual report, and I quote, the Department of Parliamentary Services had implemented security practices that helped to identify and restrict the extent of compromise, minimising the potential impact. In October 2018, the Attorney-General's Department launched PSPF reforms aimed at improving clarity, reducing unnecessary red tape and fostering a strengthened security culture across government agencies. DPS then commenced a program to demonstrate acceptable maturity against the new criteria, including engagement of KPMG to provide advice to assist DPS to further mature protective security practices. The Department has in fact achieved a maturity rating of managing against 85 of the 88 relevant PSPF criteria and a further three criteria rated as developing. The Department did not rate ad hoc against any of the 88 criteria. 
Without commenting directly on this confidential draft document, it reflects early field work by KPMG and was not scrutinised or verified by the department and does not incorporate a body of work undertaken to demonstrate that the department's PSPF maturity rating of managing for the relevant criteria. Comments in the article that methods to prevent cyber intrusions are at a low level of maturity are incorrect. The final report of the alignment review in July 2019 did not make adverse findings in relation to the department achieving an acceptable maturity rating. These matters and related ones will be dealt with through the relevant Senate committee as appropriate. I thank senators. Senator Rustin. Thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. Um, uh, last year, I gave a commitment to the Senate uh, to provide further advice in relation to um, the debt pause in uh, far north Queensland. Uh, so, following the floods uh, and the far north Queensland floods in February 2019, Services Australia uh, temporarily paused operational compliance and social welfare debt activity in re relevant local government areas, including Townsville. Uh, it's routine practice for Services SA to temporarily pause operational compliance and social uh, welfare debt activities in regional areas affected by natural disasters, uh, as is the case currently in the bushfire-affected areas in the southern states and the recent floods. This ensures that during what can be a very difficult time for customers, particularly when they're displaced or experiencing hardship, they can focus on the immediate recovery from disaster. Last year, I said to the Senate I would provide an update when the pause in relation to Townsville and the area was to be lifted. Today, I am advising the Senate that operational compliance and social welfare debt activity raising, uh, raising recovery and compensation will commence, uh, recommence for the areas that were affected by the February 2019 Far North Queensland flood uh, LGAs in the coming week. To be clear, this does not apply to cases where income averaging has been used as the sole basis for debt raising, as the government announced in November, where Services Australia calculated debt solely through the income averaging method. A debt recovery process is still frozen. Thank you, Minister. <coughs> Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Polly. President, I rise to take note of answers from Senator Colbeck to questions asked by Senator Keneally and O'Neill. Now we know that the Liberals, whenever they're in government, their track record on looking after older Australians and those mo most vulnerable is terrible. What we've had since 2013 are four failed aged care ministers. That's a record that we have. The question was asked today of the minister. Can the minister confirm that over the past two years that 30,000 older Australians have, had, have died while they've been assessed at needing home care packages? A serious question. And all we hear from the minister is excuses about the Royal Commission. And we called the Royal Commission. Well, the reason they had to call a Royal Commission was because of their own failings. They have been in government now seven years. And what they've done consecutively, the Prime Minister himself, when he was Treasurer, he cut $1.2 billion out of aged care. These are the real facts. And they wonder why we have a situation where we have still over 100,000 older Australians who have been assessed, have been assessed needing to have home care uh, packages for them, from going from level one through to the highest levels. Now, what we have seen is a government who has just put everything on hold because they've called a royal commission into their own failings. What the minister won't come into the chamber and tell us is why there are 16 reports still sitting on his desk that have been handed over from one failed minister to the other. The Tune report that he responded to and, and tried to uh, bring into his answer as some sort of, oh, here we are, we're doing something. Well, there were 38 recommendations from the Tune report. How many recommendations have been implemented? He can't tell us. Very few. The Carnell Patterson uh, report that he referred to, have all those recommendations been implemented? No, they have not. Now, older Australians 
have been assessed as needing home care packages to enable them to stay at home. Because after all, that's what older Australians want to do. That's what I would want to do. And they have failed. And then he says we invested 10,000 more packages. That was because the figure was well in excess of 110,000 when they had to be because the interim report from the Royal Commission was brought down. Oh, we better do something. The reality is this Prime Minister promised that he would do more for older Australians and he has failed, absolutely failed. As I said, they have used the aged care sector over the last six or seven years as an ATM. We'll just take that money out of there. We'll just take the money out of aged care. And then they've called a royal commission into their own failings. Now, the, there is no excuse for stalling on making real reforms into this sector and investing, because there's been report after report after report. I've sat on numerous inquiries. We already know if you actually have any compassion, any understanding of what's happening out in the community in aged care and to older Australians, you would be able to write the Royal Commission's own findings. It's not going to be a surprise because you've been told, the sector's been telling you. But you know, one of the most serious reflections that have come about because of their failings is that there are some fantastic workers in the aged care sector, some dedicated workers in the aged care sector. The majority of them are. And the poor reflection, when they get abused in the street because they happen to go into a supermarket with their aged care uniform on, because they're all being painted with the same picture, because we hear report after report about older Australians in residential home, homes aren't being properly nourished, that reflects on those workers. And they don't deserve that. Yeah. They do not reserve, yeah, yeah. deserve that. We will stand up for those workers and we will continue to hold this, uh, this failing, shonky government to account because yeah. older Australians deserve so much better than this. And there is no more excuse. Time is up. We need action and we Thank need you, it Senator now. Thank you, Senator Polly. Your time has expired. Senator Rennick. Madam Deputy President, improving aged care for all senior Australians continues to be one of the government's key priorities. That's why one of the first acts of Scott Morrison as Prime Minister was to call the Royal Commission into aged care quality and safety. That's why the government is delivering record investment across the aged care system, from $13.3 billion in 2013, growing to $21.4 billion in 2019, to an estimated $25.4 billion in 2023. That's an increase of over $5 billion of extra support for older Australians over the upcoming forward estimates. The government is also committed to giving senior Australians support to live in their own homes for longer. Since the 2018-19 budget, the government has invested in providing 44,000 new home care packages at a cost of $2.7 billion. Home care packages have increased from 60,000 under Labor in 2013 to almost 160,000 to almost yeah well that's that's an increase of 150 per cent Senator Polly uh, and over the same period a total increase in funding uh, by 250 per cent to growth uh, due to growth in high level packages. Order. And that's not as a result of this government. And to make that accusation is totally, is totally out of order. Is totally out of order. order. And can I say, unlike the Labor opposition, who are only interested in raising super to 12.5%, so their mates in the industry fund can collect more fees, we're committed to looking after all Australians, not just working Australians, but those Australians who stay at home and retirees. And for Labor to sit here and lecture us after they were going to rip the retirees off at the last election, they've got a hide. Order. They have a hide. And can I say, if you Order. want to talk about how Labor look after health, you've got to go no further than the Queensland State Labor government. What have we got here? Public health waiting lists blow out by 57,000 people. We've got ambulance ramping at South East Queensland hospitals is worsening. Maternity ward closures putting bush babies at risk. 
It goes on and on and on. Long rate for cataract, hip and knee operations. Labor has no leg to stand on when it comes to aged care and health. Their record at the state government level is shocking. Their record of looking after retirees is shocking. And can I say that despite Labor's plans for an extra $387 billion in new taxes at the last election, there is no additional funding in costings for home care places or any additional funding for aged care quality, workforce or residential aged care. So it's a bit of a case of uh, Senator O'Neill call, uh, pot calling the kettle black there, I think. Um, in response to the Royal Commission's urge for urgent, uh, call for urgent action in October 2019, the government announced a funding package of $537 million. Of this package, $496 million is for an additional 10,000 home care packages for those with the highest needs to reduce wait times and to connect people to care sooner. And that's one of the reasons I touched on this the other night, why it's very important to encourage a parent to stay at home. So not only do they look after the children, but they can also help to look after their parents, which will give the parents greater confidence in staying at home rather than having to move into an aged care facility. And that's, you know, the government should work with families to make that happen. So, thanks, Senator O'Neill. I'll take that. I just mentioned the money. It's an extra $496 million for an additional 10,000 home care packages. There's an, also another $25.5 million to improve medication management, noting that this may also assist to reduce the use of chemical and physical restraints. There is another $10 million to increase support for dementia behaviour, management through advisory services and training for care workers. It goes on. Finally, the government is investing another $4.7 million to help younger people to move from residential aged care to more age-appropriate support. It, we've also set ambitious targets to stop new younger people entering aged care by the end of 2022. Another, another plan by the government is to uh, uh, inject an almost $50 million to assist residential aged care providers in financial difficulty. Uh, especially those in regional, rural and remote areas and affected by the bushfires. Grants from this new business improvement fund will be available to homes to help them become more financially viable, particularly through improvements to their business operations by the end of February Thank 2020. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Your time has expired. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. And look, in the context of this discussion, if there's any aged care workers or people who are looking after people who are elderly, I just want to say Labor understands the pain that you are suffering at the hands of this federal government that has walked away from this sector and abrogated its responsibility. And you can tell that from what we just heard from Senator Rennick and from the minister's answers today, which are, again are pitiful. I wholeheartedly endorse the work of our aged care workers. I wholeheartedly endorse the HSU, the union that supports them and looks after them in the work that they're endeavouring to do in a sector that is completely and totally underfunded by this government. Senator Polly put on the record the shameful, the shameful failure of this government to respond to reports. And today what we saw from the minister was a disgraceful failure to acknowledge his own lies about what's been going on in this sector. New South Wales. It's a Liberal government. Mr Hazard, there's plenty of the stuff that he says I don't agree with, but he actually called this government and said that he has major concerns, major concerns about the privatisation of the ACAT assessments that are vital to getting elderly people the help that they need in Australia. Great Australians who've worked all their lives who've paid their taxes, who've brought up their kids, who, when they need a bit of help, need an assessment. And what does this government want to do? They want to privatise, privatise who can go out and do those assessments. And they continue to deny it. And I see Senator Rennick over there shaking his head and saying, no, that's not the case. But this is the document that says, who will deliver this assessment service? The new workforce will comprise a network of assessment organisations. These organisations, I'm reading from the government's own websites, will be selected through a national tender process. Now, anyone who knows what a tender process is, anybody can come and bid for the work, including what they euphemistically called other interested stakeholders. 
Now, one of the major concerns that's been raised by people who work in the sector is the problem with privatisation, apart from the fact that people just want to make money at the expense of the vulnerable, it introduces the possibility of serious conflicts of interest between healthcare companies who want to conduct these assessments as well as run the nursing homes that we're hearing about aren't even providing decent food to elderly Australians. Such a disaster, such a disaster is going on in the aged care sector after three terms of a Liberal National Party government. Mr Hazard knows what's going on and he knows that he needs to call out Senator Colbeck. Now, Senator Colbeck struggled when I asked him to actually tell the truth about what's, what he's uh, reportedly said about the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality. He, he, he was so wrong in what he said uh, that he had to be corrected by the Honourable Gaetano Pagoni QC, who is leading the Royal Commission into Aged Care. And I want to put on the record what he said. Public concern has been expressed about statements made by the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians that we, had to, that we had decided to support privatisation of the aged care assessment teams in our interim report. And I quote, this is what he says, I take this opportunity to make clear that the interim report did not endorse the government's stated position, but noted that we would monitor with interest the implementation which the government had announced. And instead, of taking the opportunity here in the Parliament of Australia to tell the truth. The minister fumbled through his notes, looking for anything that he could talk about, try to tune in to the tune report. He's tuned out from reality. That guy's got no idea about what's going on, Deputy President. The reality is he could not find the tab that said, tell the truth. He was looking for any, any bit of information other than telling the truth that he has misrepresented the Royal, the Royal Commissioner into aged care quality, that he, has, he is at odds with his colleagues in other states who know that privatisation will not deliver good value for Australians and de deliver ethical access to services for aged people. And given the opportunity, in my third question, for the minister to correct the record, he failed to do that, continuing to falsely accuse the Age Commission of supporting the government's position to privatise. They want to privatise. They are planning to rip off Australians even more than they are already doing. Aged care people who are vulnerable deserve so much better than this government. Do not give them the opportunity Thank to you, govern Senator again. O'Neill. This Your is a disgrace. Senator Scar. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Uh, at the outset, could I just say I think the Minister for Aged Care Services was absolutely crystal clear in his answers today, and he was absolutely consistent with the media release which he put out on the 14th of January 2020, which was published on 15 January 2020. It's still on his website. It's still on his website. You can read it, and this, and this is what he says. I acknowledge today's statement from the Chair of the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety, the Hon. Gatano Pagoni. The government has consistently refuted claims that our intention is to privatise the assessment process for aged care. That assertion is incorrect. That assertion is incorrect. And as the minister clearly stated again today, consistent with the media release which he put out on the 14th, 15th of January. There is a discrepancy between the minister's stated position and how it has been reported in some circles. And the minister was crystal clear in terms of his response to that issue. I'd like to take uh, note of the comments made by Senator Polly, which were simply incorrect. Simply incorrect to say that the government has cut funding to the aged care sector. Simply incorrect. The facts are these. The facts are these. The amount of funding across the aged care system, 2012 to 2013, 13.3 billion. That has now grown. Not it hasn't been cut. It is actually grown to 21.4 billion in the 2019 to 2020 budget year, up to an estimated 25.4 billion in 2022 to 2023. So the amount of funding on aged care has actually been increasing, not decreasing, increasing. Not cuts not cuts, but increases. 
And since the 2018 to 19 budget, the government has invested in providing 44,000 new home care packages at a cost of $2.7 billion. And when you drill down into the numbers, you actually see the reality. You see the truth of the situation. And it doesn't reflect well on those opposite, either with respect to their time in government or how they're misrepresenting the facts. The facts are these. Under Labor in 2012 to 2013, there were 60,308 home care packages, home care places, just over 60,000. Under the coalition in government, in 2022 to 23, that's going to increase to 158,000 places. 158,000 places. A substantial increase. A substantial increase. And when you drill down even further into the figures, this is what you see. In 2012 to 2013, the actual funding for home care funding under Labor was $1.157 billion. 2018 to 19, under the coalition government, it has increased, not decreased, increased to $2.469 billion, a substantial increase. Why? Because under the leader of the government in the Senate, under our Treasurer, we are managing fiscal policy in a prudent fashion. And that enables us that enables us to provide for the most vulnerable in our society. And we can continue to provide for them. 2019 to 20, home care funding estimate $3.43 billion, an increase from $2.469 billion 2018 to 19 to $3.43 billion in 2019 to 20, and then increasing again in 2020 to 21, up to $3.833 billion. More funds are being spent, more places are being provided. Finally, I would like to address the, what I consider to be the tawdry assertion, and it is tawdry, and I don't think it reflects well on those opposite, trying to connect deaths, fatality rates of those on waiting lists with those waiting lists, as if the fact they're on the waiting list is actually causing the fatality. And that's the, that's the premise, that's the insinuation, and it's a grubby insinuation coming from those opposite because it doesn't reflect well on them for these two reasons. First, they well know, they well know, or they should know better than I do as a relatively new senator in this place, that there are mechanism, mechanisms for those people who are in danger, who need urgent need, for their situation to be escalated up the waiting list. And I've personally advocated for people uh, in that situation to ensure they can get need, they can get assistance sooner. And secondly, the data indicates that the rate of older people passing away on waiting lists is similar for people waiting for a home care package as it is for the general population in Australia. That's what the evidence suggests. That's Thank the evidence. Thank you, Senator Scar. Your time has expired. Senator Urquhart. This is a minister who appears to be genuinely befuddled when it comes to articulating his own party's policies. In fact, from the part that we've been listening to on this matter today, I wonder if he's making any decisions at all regarding caring for ageing Australians, or whether his portfolio is actually being managed by a group of rapid privatising ideologues who simply push him out there to parp on while they run his portfolio and privatise everything in sight. So just for the record in this chamber, let's note the following points. This age, the aged care minister has never been in the Liberals' cabinet. We've had four aged care ministers since 2013. There's been a $1.5 billion cut to the aged care workforce compact and supplement, a $110 million cut from the dementia supplement in residential aged care, a $500 million cut from the 2015 MyEFO, a $1.2 billion cut from the 2016 aged care budget funding cuts to the Community Visitors Scheme and seven years of inaction, cuts, chaos and crisis. In fact, the Abbott, Turnbull, Morrison governments have done such an appalling job of driving aged care reform they have been so rubbish at it that they had to call a royal commission, basically, into it themselves. Now they have a plan to privatise the ACAT assessment services that is not supported by the aged care sector. Liberal state governments or the Royal Commissioners. In fact, Minister Hazard in New South Wales said the plan lacks logic. And one of their own says it, lock, uh, it lacks logic. Just two days prior to Christmas last year, 
the Morrison government put up on its website that new aged care assessment arrangements will provide streamlined consumer assessments for access to aged care services from April 2021. And the new network will comprise of a network of assessment organisations. These organisations will be selected through a national tender process. This tender process will happen in 2020. So on December, 30th of December, this aged care minister claimed that the Royal Commission supported the privatisation of aged care assessment services. It didn't. It did not. And it's so perturbed by this outrageous statement, on 14 January 2020, the chair of the Royal Commission issued a statement in response to the minister's comments. And Commissioner Pagoni QC stated, public concern has been expressed about statements made by the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians that we had decided to support the privatisation of the aged care assessment teams in our interim report. I take this opportunity to make clear that the interim report did not endorse the government's stated position. Commissioner Pagoni also stated, our tasks as commissioners are detailed in the terms of reference and we, will, we have not yet made recommendations about which sector or mechanism will best achieve an integration of regional assessment services and aged care assessment teams. So you might think that at this stage the minister would offer an apology to the Royal Commission or retract his false statement, but he didn't. You might think he'd go back and read the recommendations of the Commissioner's interim report and think, whoops, I'd better fix that. But that would require him to have a view on that of his own, a mind of his own, a sense for the policy direction he, as a Minister of the Commonwealth, would like for aged care in our country and the ability to clearly articulate that vision. But no. And so the ideologists pushed their obliging front man out there again and mumbled something evasive and unconvincing yet again. And that's what we've witnessed once more today here. It is very clear that the Morrison government is loose with the truth and does not want to tell the truth. Labor has voiced our concerns over the Liberal government's plan. We've been very clear that we support the joining up of assessments, clearly done by ACATS and regional assessment services, but we do not support the privatisation of the current ACATs around the country. And despite question after question, we are still being kept in the dark, as are all the Australians out there. And we still don't know why, when the Morrison government knows there is so much wrong with the aged care system, it is intent on progressing its only idea that it is to privatise aged care assessment services. We will continue to hold this government to account for its mismanagement of aged care services in Australia. Uh, thank you, um, Senator. Uh, the question is that the motion be agreed to. Yes, Senator Faruqi, so I'll come I'd, to you in a moment. Okay. I'm just taking note. I need to take note on one of I the questions. I appreciate that. Are you taking note of the same? Thank you. Uh, the question is that the motion be agreed to. All those of, of that opinion say aye. All those against say no. The ayes have it, I think. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to take note of the government's pathetic response to my questions about the impact of climate crisis on students. The government has relentlessly attacked brave students striking for climate action. In the last two years, we've heard the Prime Minister say kids should go to school. The Deputy Prime Minister denounced anything that would disrupt schools. The leader of the government in the Senate, Minister Cormann, said during the, school, during the school time kids should be in school. They say all this pretending that they care, that what they care about is keeping kids inside the classroom. But today they have refused to acknowledge that it is their woeful inaction on the climate emergency that has actually disrupted the lives and students, uh, lives and studies of Australian children this summer. The bunch of climate criminals in government have helped make natural disasters more frequent and more intense with their total lack of inaction on the climate crisis. As a result, we've seen bushfires disrupt 
the education of tens of thousands of students around the country this summer. On just one day in November, my home state of New South Wales saw more than 600 schools shut down and nine schools urgently evacuated. How dare the government demand that students concerned for their future stay in school when it is their policies that are keeping them out of the classroom in the first place? And it gets worse. As well as telling students to shut up, they tried to tell them that climate crisis is nothing to worry about. Craig Kelly told the thousands of students planning on going to the climate strike that everything you are told is a lie. He claimed the facts are there is no link between climate change and drought. According to him, despite all the experts and evidence, today's generation is safer from extreme weather than at any time in human history. And his is not a fringe view. When the Prime Minister said the worst thing he could impose on any child is needless anxiety, he flagrantly ignored striking students' legitimate worries about life under his climate-denying government. We know that the WHO regards climate change as the greatest threat to global health in the 21st century, and that includes mental health. Constant predictions of doom and gloom, of course, can be terrifying. They may create eco-fatigue, climate anxiety, and a desire to tune it all out as much as spur us into action. But the PM's response either gives you false hope by denying that the problem is not real, as if there is some validity in the view that climate change is not a thing, or it is dismissive of those people and communities who are feeling anxious about the future. Of course, we know students' worries were realized in the most tragic way, as the fires forced students from their classrooms and homes. Many were students who only months earlier had been on climate strike. Some lost everything. But still, the government refused to admit that students' climate anxiety is real and won't go away without action and strong action on the climate emergency. In fact, when you cast your eyes across the last few years, it's clear that the Liberals and Nationals have spent much more time criticizing brave children working for a better future than they have addressing their disastrous pro-coal climate policies that have us hurtling towards three degrees of warming. It's time that they swallowed their pride, <laughs> apologized to the climate strike students who are doing more than them to fight the climate crisis and get on board with tackling the climate emergency. The Greens are proud to stand with students who courageously walked out of schools and demanded action on climate change. We are with you in the streets and we are with you in this parliament. And together, we will win re-election on climate change. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those opinions say aye. Those against, no. Ayes have it. Uh, we now move to...